Our first planning speaker today is Joseph Ball, and he's going to talk about interpolation problems for vector value to Bronzhovniak spaces and applications. Joe, please. Thank you very much. I'm glad vector value to Bronzhovniak spaces was on Dan's list at the end. And the plan, and it's a pleasure to be participating in this virtual intense workshop. And my plan is to have three parts. First, I'll talk about interpolation for short class operator value functions, which is older stuff. And more recently, we looked at with Vladimir Bolotnikov and Sane Terhorst, we looked at interpolation problems for vector value to Brown's Rovnak space functions. And then time permitting, there will be some applications at the end. So part one is sure class functions. And my notation will be telegraphic UYX or always over spaces. SUY is a sure class functions. Values are holomorphic on the disk and values are contraction operators from U to Y. Then it's well known the following or equivalent S is sure class, the De Bronze Roadmap kernel, which we've seen many times, but I'll have this notation, capital S rather than the little b and it's operator value between two Hilbert spaces. You have this operator value kernel. It's a positive kernel, which for the operator value case is this condition. And it has equivalent is they have a Kolmogorov decomposition, which means it can be factored through a H holomorphic function D operators from X to Y. And, uh, and also important for me, another equivalent characterization is it has a unitary state space realization. Namely, there's what we call a unitary system matrix, <clears throat> a block two by two, which takes direct sum of state space X input space Y, U to state space X direct sum output space Y. And it has this representation from determined from the system matrix. And there's control motivation, namely behind all this is a linear input state output linear system. You feed in inputs u at time n, and you initialize the state at time zero. Then the first equation updates the state at time n plus one. And the second equation reads out an output at time n and only involves state and input at time n. So we think of the uh, non-negative integers as our time domain and n as a time and this is evolving in discrete time. Then you can uh, apply the Fourier transform for this situation which engineers call Z transform, namely you convert the string of vectors to the power series, call that W hat. And when you apply this to the original system equations, you get the frequency domain version of the system equations. And then we have functions. Uh, resolvent of A uh, adjusted, so time minus ZA inverse, times initial condition plus ZIZ I minus ZA inverse B transform of U and Y hat reads out what depends on the initial state and what depends on the input. So we have a special notation for the part depending on only on the initial condition. O for observability operator, the idea is that this tells you what you observe in the frequency domain if you have an initial state and the input signal is zero. So that's called observability operator. And the second term of theta u is called the transfer function with this formula because that tells you the tr transform of the output 
from the transform of the input. Um, and you assume x naught equals zero in order to get this part. So it's just superposition of the two pieces. It's linear in the input state, initial condition on the state and the input sigma. Um, <clears throat> so furthermore, so we have this, this just repeats what we had on the previous slide. If U is unitary and A is stable, so that's what the engineers call the condition that you hit powers of A on any X naught in the state space, it goes to zero in norm of the state space X. Uh, if you have these two conditions, then the observability operator has a map from X to H to Y is isometric. And furthermore, the transfer function theta, theta sub U should have been, is inner, meaning it's an isometry also. And so the block rho is, uh, this is an orthogonal decomposition. So the block rho operator matrix here is, it turns out to also be unitary and we have this direct sub decomposition. So that's the nicest case when U is unitary and A is stable. If either of those fail, then various parts of this fail. Then uh, if you like uh, more compact formulas, the OCA can be expressed directly in terms of the colligation matrix U um, in such a way, and that's convenient for computations, but we won't get that. We won't be using it here because we're not getting into the weeds of the computations. Um, so you can have this more compact form for this row matrix. Uh, then the interpolation problem for short class functions, which was an active area in the 80s and 90s because of connections with H infinity control. And I'll focus on left tangential nonlinear pick interpolation problem with given points on the disk and vectors in the output space Y and vectors in the input space U. You want to find a function S in the short class so that. The row vector, if you like, hit on S of ZI is the row vector CI star. And um, then what was done in the 80s and 90s, we have a more compact uh, matrix way of expressing these interpolation conditions. So in general, you take a uh, pair of operators ET, E maps X to Y, T is an operator on X. We're interested in it being output stable, which means the associated observability operator is bounded as an operator from X to H to Y. Um, so this is the formula and it has to land on H to Y and there's estimates on the norm, closed graph theorem it's bounded if it's defined. Uh, anyhow, um, so this, there's an X missing there. For all X and X, you, you end up in H2Y. Then left tangential operator argument point evaluation, you take a H infinity function S in general. And the idea is you substitute for the argument Z an operator T star, but keep it to the left and apply that to the uh, operator E star applied to S. <clears throat> so um, you F, Sn is the coefficient times T star N, but T star N is on the left and it's actually applied to the function E star S. So this is your formula. So you think of this as evaluation of E star S with argument T star on the left. Um, then there's a little computation here, which shows that when ET is output stable, and S is an H infinity, then we see the series converges. And actually this left tangential operator argument gadget is adjoint observability operator applied to multiplication operator S restricted to U. Um, and then when we take, our example, we let E star be this 
column of rows, n star being this column of rows, t star to be this diagonal, then this point evaluation, left tangential operator argument evaluation will just be stacking up these things, a sub i star, s of z sub i. And we take n star to be c1 star c n star. So then our uh, e setting left tangential operator argument e star s of t star equal to n star amounts to the aggregate of all these individual left tangential interpolation conditions. So for this example, left tangential operator argument point evaluation interpolation written in compact form like this is the same as what we had before where we had this collection of individual interpolation conditions. So if we study left tangential operator argument interpolation, we're really also studying more concrete things with pointwise interpolation conditions in left direction. Um, <clears throat> and then it's convenient that we can uh, convert this thing to just writing adjoint observability operator ET MS is adjoint observability operator NT on all of H2. So our LTOA interpolation problem is actually an equation between, for operators from H2U to X, namely OET star MS is the adjoint observability operator NT. And then the theme of this talk is equalities are disguised inside inequalities. So the previous slide says we can write our interpolation problem as a condition equation on operators from <clears throat> all of H two U to uh, state space O E T star M S equals O E N star. Then there's a little computation here that says um, the difference of the, what are called observability Gramians turns out to have this form with I minus MS MS star in the middle. S is in sure class says multiplication by S as an operator H2 to H2 is a contraction. So this guy is positive semi-definite. So I define an operator P on X as the difference of these observability Gramians it being positive semi-definite is necessary for the existence of a solution to the uh, <clears throat> ten left tangential interpolation problem. Then the non-trivial fact is it's that uh, this condition is also sufficient and there are all kinds of schools, different ways to do this. Um, so let me consider the, uh, the the nicest case is T is strongly stable, which we've mentioned before, and P is strictly positive definite. Then what I'm gonna say actually applies with just ET uh, <clears throat> uh, output stable, but it's easier when T is strongly stable. So uh, what you do, and the amazing thing here is that all the formulas are explicit. You don't see where the formulas are coming from, but they all make sense. So you can construct a J inner function, theta. J inner means it conjugates this J, and this J is a uh, this signature matrix self-adjoint and unitary. Um, and the technical difficulty is maybe M theta, multiplication by theta is not in H infinity, so it's not a bounded operator on L2. Nevertheless, we have the result S solves the left tangential interpolation problem based on the, this data set. 
if and only if there's a free parameter allographic E in your Schur class so that S has a chain matrix linear fractional transformation representation in terms of the free parameter Schur class function E. Um, so when you have P strictly positive definite, you have lots of Schur class solutions based on this formula. And sometimes you can use that to get to do an approximation to get the result. P is only sem positive semi-definite. Um, so to construct the theta, what you do is uh, for uh, simplicity, we'll set C equal to column EN. We want to construct a system matrix where T and C we know, B, D we have to find so that U is uh, unitary in this metric, P, J. So here there's a typo, it should be U star P inverse P zero zero J U equals P zero zero J and this one's correct. So there's my first major typo and uh, to do this, it turns out you, you have to solve for the B and D, as I already said, that amounts to solving this Cholesky factorization problem, which is solvable in the hypothesis we have on T and C. Then you let theta Z be the uh, transfer function of the system associated with system matrix U. Um, so it will have this form and that's the theta which will then have the uh, requisite properties. Um, so the observability operator, if you have T strongly stable is isometric from X with the P metric into H2 values in Y direct sum U, but the metric is the indefinite metric with the J, M theta possibly unbounded is J unitary on L2. You close up M theta on the polynomials. It's the J orthogonal complement of the range of the observability operator. So it's a J in indefinite burling lax theorem we have here. And then the assertion is S solves left tangential interpolation problem based on this data if and only if uh, S is in the image of this linear fractional map. So this is the work done 80s and 90s. And when T is not strongly stable to various difficulties, but the result is still true. Um, so the Ukrainian school led by Otapov, centered in Kharkov, Ukraine, had a different approach. So the preliminary score is just the Douglas slump, which has come up in previous lectures. If you have given operators A and B between appropriate spaces, you wanna find an X with the compatible spaces so that norm X less than one at X equals B, then the necessary and sufficient condition for existence of such an X is B, B star less than or equal to A, A star in the Lubner ordering. By sure complements, that's the same as this matrix of positive semi -death. Then we can consider the case where we're given A, B, and X, and we want to test whether this X works. Namely, we want to know if norm X less than one and X equals B. So what's a single test for this, where you're, you've already chosen the X? Then it turns out that you need positivity of this three by three block matrix. M given here. And this is just more sure complement analysis. M positive semi-definite by you take the sure complement um, with respect to the three by three entry, which is the identity. So that sure complement is this difference, which works out to be this. This being positive definite gives us equality. B has to equal AX. And also 
from the one one entry we see norm x less than to the one. Um, so it was a cute observation I just came up with for preparing the slides. The original Douglas lemma is a matrix completion problem. Namely, you form this matrix M, you, can, you assume the two principal uh, two by two block matrices are positive semi-definite. You don't know X, can, when, can, when can you find X? So the whole thing is positive semi-definite. So if the obvious necessary conditions are satisfied, then it's a theorem that that's all it takes to find an X which completes the matrix to a positive semi-definite. And that way we see the original Douglas lemma as a matrix completion problem. Given A, B, you have to find X so that this M is positive semi-definite under the assumption for the Douglas lemma, this uh, two by two submatrix uh, left upper left corner is positive semi-definite. And the other two by two is positive semi-definite by inspection. So there's a whole slew of papers on this topic from the 80s. This is a, just a little example. Um, now we come, this is familiar for everybody who's been following the, um, these lectures. <clears throat> Uh, given a short class function, I've already mentioned the Branch Roadmap kernel. So there's an associated the Branch Roadmap space, which is consists of vector value functions. And I'll need this other uh, characterization of the Branch Roadmap space mentioned by Dan and I suppose lots of other people. You can also see it as a range of this topless operator, I minus MS MS star to the one half acting on H2Y. And if you use the lifted norm um, on this range space, then they co coincide isometrically. Um, so this is useful. Then we have a positive kernel reformulation of our whole left tangential operator argument interpolation problem. Suppose we have data which is admissible. So we just ask ET is output stable. Um, we're given S holomorphic values in L of EY. We set FS equal to this. The following are equal to S solves our interpolation problem with this data set. So that means that's a sure class and it satisfies left tangential operator argument interpolation conditions. <clears throat> Equivalent to that is a certain block two by two matrix is positive semi-definite, bold P. And that's equivalent to a kernel. Uh, this kernel is a positive kernel on B. And then the new one is, that's equivalent to S is in the sure class, FS times X, here's FS, lands you in the branch Rovnik space based on S with the branch Rovnik space norm less than or equal to norm P to one half X. For all x. And in this case, that's equivalent to the inequality is an equal equality. That's special for this um, output stable case. Um, then I'll discuss outline of the proofs. Two, if and only of three, here's two and three again. Then you're supposed to be able to see by inspection that if you take F the next direct sum H2Y of this form and take this matrix P, but the quadratic form evaluate on a vector of this form, then 
you get the kernel acting on vectors x, y. Um, so p positive means the left-hand side positive, then the right-hand side positive, but that's the definition of the kernel is positive and conversely. So that's all, this is just translation from operator formulation to kernel formulation. Then one implies five, repeat what one is and what five is. Then FS by definition is OET minus MSOMT, but we've seen the interpolation is that ONT should be the same as MS star OET. Then we can rewrite this I minus MS MS star OET. So therefore norm squared FS, so, so that means that FS maps into the branch road next space because the branch road next space is the ring of I minus MS MS T star to one half. And furthermore, when you compute the norm, you go through a certain computation here and you end up with equality equals norm P to one half X squared X. Uh, so that's one implies five and five implies four trivially because four was five with any one instead of equality. Four if we only have two, here's two again, here's four again. So this is a, this would be a sure complement argument if it were the case that P were invertible. But even with P just positive semi-definite, there's a finer version of sure complement argument, which will get you to this. Um, so that's my discussion of, oh, so furthermore, two if and only if one, here's one and two again, um, then uh, the P by definition was this difference of observability gramians, and we put in what FS was, then by a sure complement argument, that's the same as this three by three thing, because this P is <clears throat> sure complement of this guy with respect to the one one inch. Then this is just exactly the three by three we saw in the Douglas slum of variant. So that is the test exactly for norm MS less than or equal to one. And the operator required no NT equals MS star o OET. So therefore, which is that S solves left tangential operator argument interpolation problem. And that gives us two implies one, but in fact, one implies two because the, all these steps are reversible. So now this was the big advance that the interpolation condition um, can be converted to <clears throat> this uh, FSX maps state space in the H of KS with control on the norm. That's what only the Ukrainian school had, it seems to me. Um, so the conclusions are um, that this suggests generalizations. Um, two, three, and four um, make sense. P is any positive semi-definite operator. And we need only assume that the observability operator maps X into polymorphic functions with values in Y direction. You, you don't have to have that it maps into H2. And the proofs uh, that we went through, so the, the, the first condition doesn't make sense because it asks that this observability operator map into H2. But the remaining ones make sense. And furthermore, you can, the proofs we went through work without the assumption that ET is a uh, output stable pair. Um, 
then, um, but we should also assume that um, P, not P anything for the proofs, but P satisfies this so-called Stein equation. And in the, no contradictions, in the case when P is strongly stable, then this thing we had before is the only solution of the Stein equation. Um, so everything fits and we have what we're going to call analytic abstract interpolation problem because there's another abstract interpolation problem which is even more general. So we assume only observability operator maps into holomorphic functions on D. And there's some solution of our Stein equation, which is positive semi-definite, and that's part of the data. Then any other conditions, two, three, four, can be taken as the definition of a more general problem. Um, so then we have a theorem. We'll take as the definition, which was condition four, FS defined to be OET minus observability operator ET minus multiplication by S observability operator NT operator from X to reproducing kernel space based on the branch Robnet kernel S, S in the Shore class. Uh, so we have a space H of KS is such that you hit for every vector in the state space, you hit FS on it, the norm in H of KS is less than the norm P to one half X in X. Then we have, oh, I keep forgetting. Um, This is where I was. And then we want to talk about parameterizing this solutions of this problem. Uh, so we can do it if P is strictly positive definite, then we can still construct theta as above. Then it's still the fact that any solution S is of a form in the image of the linear fractional map coming from this J inner theta. And so we have to have a proof starting with four, which is now our definition instead of the old one. And uh, the definition now is that uh, doesn't look like an interpolation condition at all. S solves our problem if this FS, which can be written like this, maps our state space with the P metric contractively into our De Bruyne's row next space. But I'm not doing the details. There's a general reproducing kernel Hilbert space result that uh, this observability operator maps state space isometrically on to reproducing kernel space with reproducing kernel KP, ENTT, where KP ENT is this kernel. And um, this theta ZJ theta zeta star one minus Z zeta bar is exactly the J orthogonal complement and the nice, so now it's a more general kind of complement. Um, this space, uh, th this kernel is the same as this kernel where the theta comes in. Then there's a general result that if uh, a map of this type, uh, if you're mapping uh, this space, uh, th this uh, space with this kernel, contractively into H of KS, that's the same as S belongs to the range of that linear fractional map. So we're done. So this was the Latapov school clean version 
to get to this um, linear fractional parameterization, and it works without the strong stability assumption. <clears throat> um, it, it works with this more general situation where the output stability assumption is removed, it was a really operator just has to map in the holomorphic functions. So the payoff is you have a more general application. You can do boundary node linear thick interpolation with bounds on angular derivatives. So I'm not getting into the, all the details. In this case, P is not uniquely determined by the Stein equation. Diagonal entries of P provide bounds on angular derivatives at interpolation nodes on the boundary. And this is the natural in terms of function theory. This is a natural problem when you try to do boundary interpolation. You can't get a nice uh, <clears throat> linear fractional formula for the solutions unless you also impose bounds on angular derivatives. So the operator theory fits with the function theory. Um, there's also parameterization in the case P is only positive semi-definite, uh, which is a little different. So we'll let XP be the Hilbert space with norm taken from P. So if P is only positive semi-definite to have a kernel, if there is a kernel, you're only talking about equivalence classes and even if there's not a kernel, then you have to complete it. It's not complete. So I'm not going to get into that. So we're just going to assume everything works out and I won't want to distinguish X and XP. Everything does work out with additional details, which nobody would follow anyhow. Then we assume it satisfies the Stein equation. Then there's something related to what has come to be known as a lurking asymmetry argument. So I define domain of bold B is the range of the column. This is a subspace of uh, the state space X direct sum, the input space U, range of bold V, closure of the range column T. This is subspace of state space X direct sum, output space Y. And the formula is you take I in X to T E X. Then the Stein equation star is exactly what you need to see that V is an isometry. Norm of I in X in X U is the same as the norm of T E X in um, X Y. Um, so this is the lurking, we call this the lurking asymmetry for this problem because then we want to complete it to a unitary. Um, so we say a system matrix, state space H, input space U to state space H, output space Y is a minimal unitary system matrix extension of V. Um, the original state space X with the P norm is a subspace of H. You restrict U to DV, you get V, mapping DV to RV. And if you have a subspace of H containing X, it's reducing for U, then it has to be all of H. And then we have a theorem characterizing solutions of this mysterious problem, analytic abstract interpolation problem, S solves AAIP with a miscible data set T, E, and P, if and only if uh, that's a S, has the form um, D plus C, C, I minus C, A inverse D, where this is the transfer function of a system matrix U, H U to H Y, <clears throat> which has to be a minimal unitary system matrix extension. Um, also closely connected, but 
there's another condition so that you get the minimality here, but I forgot to write it down. Anyhow, I'm not going to define it. So you can ignore it. Of the partially defined isometry V constructed from V. And in this case, the associated map FS is given explicitly just by the observability operator <clears throat> from this system matrix. And you have to restrict to the state space X, which is a subspace of the big state space H. Um, then to get the parameterization of the solution set, there's a result I should have written arrow from Grossman from the late 80s, I think, that minimal unitary system matrix extensions of V are given by free parameter closely connected, which I want to find, well, the span of the observability space and the controllability space has to be the whole space if you know what that means. Um, so you have a free parameter unitary system matrix U1 and you have to feedback couple it with a certain universal unitary system matrix U0 constructed just from the data. So there are these ingredients. So one is the universal guy, bold U0. <clears throat> we have to introduce defect spaces, delta and delta star. We need new copies. So I want to have, there's unitary maps between delta and delta tilde. I want to consider them distinct, even though, so they're just the same dimension Hilbert space. Delta tilde star, another copy of delta star, and so on. And they're explicit identification maps. Now, domain of V directs some delta is the same as X directs some U because uh, domain of V was orthogonal complement of uh, delta was orthogonal. There are these defect spaces. Yeah, so with, by definition, delta was orthogonal complement of X U of DV. So when you take dv throw in delta, but it's written as a block form here. If you ignore the block structure, it's the same as xu, and similarly rv directs some delta stars the same as x directs some y. So we use this latter decomposition to decompose u0 as a three by three block, and from the way it's defined, did I define it? Um, there's a line missing here. You define it takes delta to delta to delta unitarily, and then um, you have to make it unitary when you restrict to X, you go to X and that's a unitary. Um, <clears throat> subject to the restriction to Delta V is what you want it to be. Um, so second ingredient is the free parameter guy. So this is a colligation matrix and has a state space X1. And then the feedback connection U0, U1, um, U takes state space vector XX1, input vector U to state space vector X tilde, X tilde one. 
Y exactly when you can find delta tilde, delta tilde star in the tilde spaces so that our universal guy takes this column to this column. And you want to take this column to this column. So you see there's a feedback, the delta tilde here has to be the same as the delta tilde here. The delta tilde star here has to be the same as the delta tilde star here. And if you're lucky, you can solve, well, you are lucky because U33 is zero. So you can solve explicitly and you get all this mess. And then <clears throat> uh, the result of Arif Grossman is you take the transfer function of this coupled thing, then um, you're getting what you want. Um, so here's the transfer function of the universal guy. And we'll rate that with sigmas. Then there's a red heifer linear fractional transformation associated with that. And sigma z is sure class because uh, this was, that's what happens with this type of linear fractional transformation. And sigma two, two of zero is zero. So <clears throat> you can load it with any sure class guy and the result is well-defined in given sure class. And in fact, we have the U is the feedback connection U zero, U one. So when you take transfer function of u on z, it's the same as red hair for a mu zero transfer function on u one of z. Um, but transfer function u one is a free sure class function because u one was a free unitary colligation subject only to being closely connected, which doesn't affect the transfer function. So that's our parameterization. Set of all solutions for our problem is given by red heifer transform, sigma computed in this way, applied to a free parameter sure class function. Uh, now there's a few minutes left for part two. And I want to define a abstract interpolation problem for the bronze roadmap space. So the data is a sure class function, T E N R as before, and X is a vector in the state space. S uh, that should be sure class, not L. And uh, T is an operator. E is an operator x to y, and I'm running out of time. Um, so there's a um, similar type problem. You want to get to x, and you have a norm bound in the Runge Romnick space. And um, this picks up. Um, inter interpolation conditions for f in vector value in the, our branch Romanek space with the norm constraint. And there's a uh, characterization of solutions with a matrix inequality, operator inequality. And there's an application of the Douglas lemma. So if you're given the X and everything. F solves our problem if and only either of these kernel, this matrix is positive definite or this kernel is positive definite, parallels what we did before. And we can associate a sure operator value problem of the sort we discussed before, pick off the red heifer linear fractional parameterization from that and use functions from that to describe solutions of our uh, de bronze Robnet interpolation problem, norm less than equal to one. And uh, you can describe all this. And the application is if S B are inners, MS is an isometry, 
then MSH2 is the form of a general shift invariant subspace. KS is the model space. B is another inner function. What we're interested in here is to characterize intersections. Uh, well, then these intersections are known. And what we're interested in is to describe model space intersects shift invariant subspace in H2. And uh, we can use what we've done before to get a explicit description of the space MSB, namely multiplication G times um, the branch Romnick space associated with E is the unique function in this sure class such that red heifer transformation sigma applied to E gives us our sure class function S. Um, and furthermore, this multiplication operator from the branch Romnick space to this space is unitary. And the last observation is this is connected with talks we've heard earlier, parameterizing kernels of Toplitz operators to almost in invariant subspaces, backward shift invariant subspaces, and such things, which is many more details. And I'll finish there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Joe, indeed. Let's thank the speaker. Is there any question or comments for Joe? I have a very naive question indeed uh, about the Douglas criteria you mentioned at the very beginning, going from I mean, A star less than B star to a three by three matrix. Is this just a reformulation of the, the criteria that I, or there is, which is more compatible for your application? I think it's different because in the second one, you're given the X. Yes. Ah. You want to test if that X you're given works. Yes. So that's the difference. That's, that's all. Okay. In, a, in the original Douglas criterion, you can think of the X as unknown. And then the second condition gives you this matrix completion problem. Okay. So that's how I yeah, think of the Douglas criterion can also be thought of as this matrix completion problem. It's all the same. And the Douglas criterion is embedded in there as the two by two block upper left corner. That being positive definite was the original Douglas criterion. Sure. Thank you, Joe. Any further comments or questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Who indeed? And we resume in seven minutes.